All right. Okay. Um, well, as Courtney already said, the title of my talk is Future JavaScript, What is Still Missing? What can you expect from this talk? In recent years, JavaScript has grown considerably, especially ECMAScript 6 has been a huge release of ECMAScript. And now it's already a nicely well-rounded language. So modules added a lot. And with, uh, for example, async iteration, the whole story of asynchronicity is quite nice now in JavaScript. And that... Um, leads to the question, are there still features that are missing? So what would still be, even with all the things we already have, what would still be nice to have? And what I'll be talking about is my opinion. I'll talk about the features that I consider most important only. Uh, there are a lot of others that may or may not be useful, but there's also a risk of bloating the language if you add too much. And most of the things I show you are actually based on official feature proposals, so it's a legitimate look into the future of JavaScript. First, I'd like to give you a little background with regard to how JavaScript is actually designed. And with ECMAScript 6, we had, well, as I said before, a, a huge release. So that has a few problems. So after ECMAScript 6, TC39, that is the committee that evolves JavaScript, decided to adopt a more agile approach. And now, the focus is on features, not on releases anymore. So people write proposals for features. These features go through stages from zero to four. And then you have a release once a year. And due to the stages, it, it becomes, it's, a, it's a very simple process. You have the deadline, and whatever feature has reached stage, uh, stage four, at that point, it becomes part of the release. So that's nice and incremental, uh, nicely agile. This is what this uh, process looks like. You can see the stages from uh, zero to four. And two things I'd like to point out is, or, well, actually several you have these requirements before you can enter a new stage. And even for stage zero, TC39 has to have had a look at your proposal. So you have to present your proposal in, in front of TC39. And then the proposal is at stage zero. Another thing that I find interesting and very important is before you can enter stage two, can you see, yeah, you can see the cursor. Before you can enter stage two, there have to be two implementations of your feature. So uh, uh, stuff you propose is actually tested in the wild, and it's not this kind of abstract specification, and that is really nice. A and before a feature reaches uh, stage four, uh, uh, there have to be acceptance tests for the feature, and that ensures that the, uh, the various JavaScript engines are compatible. And it's, it's amazing how compatible they are. And that's due to this test suite. We'll start with desirable features that are related to values. Right now, if you compare values in JavaScript, there is a distinction. There are two kinds of values. On one hand, you have primitive values, and these are compared by value. So you look at, the, if, if you compare two values, you look at the content, and you compare the content. And that's why these two strings here are, are considered equal. On the other hand, whenever you have an object, and arrays are objects too, then you don't look at the content, you compare the identity. And 
these are two different objects with the same content, and those are considered to be not equal. What would be nice to have is if you're, for example, if you're implementing something custom uh, like a point or a complex number, what would be nice to have is comparison by value for objects. So how could that be done? And there's, unfortunately, there's currently no proposal. Two possibilities are, so, um, well, the, the foundation is that you have to have a new kind of object that is compared differently. And to go with this new kind of object, what you want is a new, new factories for objects. And that could be, uh, for example, a new kind of literal for objects. And here you're creating two uh, value, objects that are compared by value. And these have the same content. And now they're considered to be equal. The other possibility is, again, complementary. It doesn't exclude the other possibility. Uh, would be to have a new kind of class or to just tag a class as one that produces um, value objects. Value types and value objects also help with data structures because at the moment, if you're putting, if you're using objects as keys, that almost makes no sense, um, well, unless you're using a weak map. So, or rarely, I, I, offhand, I can't come up with a use case. Because if you're adding the same object twice, you get, um, as a key, you get two entries, as you can see here. So we've added two different entries because, again, we're comparing by reference, by identity. Another value-related feature is, um, are the so-called big ints. Because right now, what you have is when you use JavaScript numbers, you have 53 bits plus a sign for integers. And if you go beyond um, this range, there are holes in the, uh, in the space. So there are two. JavaScript numbers represent, uh, or no, uh, the same JavaScript number stands for two uh, mathematical integers. So we can see that here, if here we are at the upper end of the range, and if we add one, uh, nothing changes. So there is a hole after uh, 992. On the other hand, if you use uh, big ints, whose proposal is at stage three at the moment, you don't have any such problems because the size of a big int grows as necessary. So if, you've, if you always add one and the number grows larger, more bits are added uh, as needed to represent uh, any, any number you, you need. And here you can see if we have the, they have this, this uh, suffix n, which means that there are big ints. And if you're adding uh, one n to the number that ends with 992, you actually, you really do increment by one. And if you want uh, fixed size of integers, for example, if you're working with 64-bit uh, numbers, uh, integers for uh, databases, what you can do is you can cast. And here we're casting two operands, and afterwards we cast the result of multiplying them, and that ensures that we always correctly stay within 64 bits. But usually you'll just use uh, big ints like that, and they'll grow as necessary. Another value-related feature is computation with base 10 floating point numbers. At the moment, JavaScript numbers are base 2 floating point numbers. And then you have the classic here that's sometimes used to, to make fun of JavaScript. But actually, that's an issue that other languages have, have just as well. So if you do the same computation in, say, uh, Python, 
you get the same issue um, because uh, Python as well as JavaScript, they are both, um, uh, the numbers are based on, the, on IEEE standards. So that's nothing JavaScript specific. If, on the other hand, you have uh, base 10 floating point numbers, uh, you don't get any problems, and the result is as you'd expect. And that matters whenever you do scientific computing in JavaScript, and it also matters uh, when you work in fintech and do any kind of uh, financial computation. So if you do your taxes in JavaScript, you don't want uh, there to be any rounding errors. When it comes to categorizing values, um, JavaScript is also a, a tiny bit quirky. You have to decide if you want to use type of or instance of, depending on the check you want to perform. Uh, type of has its own set of quirks. Uh, type of null is the, the famous one. That null is um, the type of things that null is an object, which it isn't. Instance of has the issue that if a, an instance or a class comes from another realm, like a frame in, in a web browser, then instance of doesn't work as you'd expect. The next group of features is about functional programming. If you look at languages that have syntax that comes from the C family, then they make an unfortunate distinction between expressions and statements. So expressions are uh, syntactic constructs that produce values when they're evaluated, and statements are constructs that, that, that do something. And that leads to JavaScript having two kinds of uh, conditional constructs. So on one hand, you have the, the ternary operator, uh, which is an expression that does an if-then-else, and then you have an if-then-else statement. There is a proposal that is called do expressions, and this proposal lets you use statements in expression contexts. So what you do is you use these uh, curly braces, you tag them with a do, and then this is a do expression. And inside it, you can use uh, several statements. And these statements themselves act a little bit more uh, like expressions. So the last value that is mentioned becomes the result of the whole do expression. And that is very useful whenever, for example, for setting up constants, because you can do it in, in one step in one block what you'd act, uh, otherwise have to do externally. Uh, so that is one nice use case. React will uh, profit from that as well, because in React, you often have, like, you use the ternary operator a lot. And with uh, do expressions, you have more room. Um, and you can use nicer syntax. Pattern matching is. Another feature that is inspired by functional programming and pattern matching is nice whenever you have to switch cases depending on the structure of data. So if, for example, you're processing syntax trees or if you're working with nested JSON data, then this is, uh, this is really nice. And it's partially based on the structuring, so you're both checking the structure, so here we're checking that property status is 200, but you also um, can extract something out of the data, and that is done via the structuring. Uh, here, example, here, for example, we extract the content length uh, into the variable s, so that's nice. And the proposal for that is currently at stage one. Then there's the pipeline operator. There are two competing proposals. We look at one of them, the, the one I like better, and that one is uh, called Smart Pipelines. And the pipeline operator works as follows. It's useful whenever you have deeply nested function applications 
with the pipeline operator, you can write those in, more, in a more intuitive way because you show the flow of the data. Because if you, if you look at the whole computation, what you start with is actually the x, and that is the input of an f, and the output of applying f to the x is fed into g, the result is fed into h. So whenever you have a multiple step process, when you compute something, the pipeline operator is, is really nice. And um, a sub-feature for the pipeline operator that I really like is it could have, potentially have, built-in partial application. The way this works is you have a placeholder in here, so that's the hash symbol. Some people also say the hashtag symbol. Uh, and then the... And what's cool about that is you can actually implement functions, tool functions, and then use them as if they were methods. So what we're doing down here is we're importing uh, two functions from, uh, from our utility module, and then thanks to partial application, we can pipe them or chain them as we otherwise would methods. So that makes it really easy to extend uh, classes or uh, objects externally and use them in a, in a functional way. You don't have to add new methods. Another group of features concerns uh, concurrency. And here, at the moment, the de facto standard is the worker API. And that API has recently also been added to Node.js, which is really nice to have the same API on, on both platforms. One problem with the workers is that they're relatively heavyweight. Each worker has its own realm. And for example, it comes with its own uh, global variables. So starting a worker takes time and, and resources. And what I would like to have is something more lightweight, where you can start processes in a more lightweight manner. And one language that does that a lot and, and is very productive and with it and uses that to, to great effect is Erlang, as an example. So lightweight uh, concurrency would be nice to have. Another group of features is the standard library. And this is where JavaScript at the moment has the most deficiencies, or well, deficiency is not the right word, uh, looks the most feeble uh, when compared with other languages that have a, a richer standard library. And that is something that is also at the moment being considered by TC39, how to best extend it. Uh, because it doesn't come for free. I mean, with uh, upgrading is, for example, is easier if, if you just host a module in NPM and with the standard library, you really just want to have the core functionality. And one kind of cosmetic thing that I would like to see is at the moment, JavaScript has several namespace objects, and these are kind of poor man's modules. And they exist because in the beginning, they wanted to group um, sets of functions, but JavaScript didn't have modules yet, so what you did was you just introduced a namespace object. Instead, it'd be nice if there were actually built-in modules. And this is what this could look like. You'd introduce um, a special protocol to have this kind of identifier for, uh, for built-in modules. And you'd import function max from this module. You would use it down here. And this is opposed to the current way of doing things, where you use the namespace object math. And the advantage is that the, the language becomes more modular. And if you import something from a module, 
the, the invoking that is quicker than uh, doing uh, finding a property on on an object such as math. One functionality that I think should definitely be added to the standard library are helpers for iterables. And ideally, or it should be both synchronous iterables and asynchronous iterables. And at the moment, if you have an iterable, like up here, this is a set. If you want to do anything with it, such as filter it, you have to convert it into an array before you can process it further. And if you had actually a helper that worked directly with iterables, you could do it like down here. You could apply filter directly to the iterable and produce another iterable. And that would allow nice on-demand pipelining of the whole thing. So that would be really great to have. Uh, Python is inspiring in that regard. They have a module that's called iterTools. And they have a lot of tool functions for iterables. Immutable data or support for immutable data would also be nice. At the moment, we have, among others, two libraries that are possible, uh, uh, popular. The first one is called Immer. It's more lightweight. It works directly with object and arrays, and, but processes them and never mutates anything. And then you have immutable JS, and that one is more heavyweight and has its own data structure. So, Something in that vein would be nice to have in the standard library. Better support for date times would be really cool as well, because at the moment, the best practice for JavaScript dates is don't use them, <laughs> or at least uh, not directly. Uh, there are several nice libraries out there. Uh, thankfully, TC39 is working on an updated date API, and that one is called Temporal. Uh, here you see that we work with an abstract uh, date time instance, or date time, and then uh, we use it relative to a, or we use a time zone down here, and and. Just using time zones at the moment with the data APIs is, is uh, not much fun. And lastly, uh, a few features may actually not be needed. So one is uh, optional chaining that is uh, very popular, so I'm not going to say too much against it. I'm just... Uh, just um, uh, the... Here, uh, if you dig deeply into an object via and you, you chain uh, property accesses, uh, you can use this operator. And whenever there is an undefined or null in between, you just get undefined or null at the end. So it's, it's safe that way. Uh, on, so it's nice and concise, but there's a con. You should avoid deeply these deeply nested accesses uh, because your data becomes harder to change if you do that. And being this tolerant can hide problems that, uh, that surface later on. So the alternatives are to pre-process the data before you work for it and make it uh, work with it and make it more compact, or to have dealt, uh, helper functions that extract data. And what may not be needed either is operator overloading that would be a uh, a simpler solution, and that would be infix function application down here. Uh, so we'll see how that plays out. Uh, but it's, it's easier to understand. It's relatively easy to use. And yet, if you have uh, nested expressions, they look as nice as if you had uh, real operator overloading. So that is a, a, a potential uh, alternative. All right, so let's get to the uh, takeaways. Uh, at the moment, JavaScript is already a fairly well-rounded language. The main wish wishes that I have are value types, big ints and big decimals, the pipeline operator, lightweight concurrency, and a bigger standard library. 
And if you want to download the slides, uh, this is the QR code for it. This is the URL where you can find the slides. You can uh, read. Uh, so this blog post is a transcription. And my JavaScript books are free to read online. Thank you. Thank you.